It's Thursday, everyone. Coming up tonight on Now, we are live in Sanford. A massive fire tore through a few buildings, starting in an apartment building. A lot of people right now questioning whether it has to do with what they're calling a drug problem in that area. We'll have the latest. Plus, body cameras on police officers. Obviously, they answer a lot of questions, but what is it like to be the officer actually carrying one? This is New Center Now. There's this big fire. Like it sounded like glass broke. Like it was so scary. Fire tears through parts of a Sanford city block and crews from all over southern Maine converge on Island Avenue trying to stop that blaze from jumping between buildings. Good evening, everyone. I'm Amanda Hill. Lee Goldberg is off tonight. We have team coverage in Sanford. Chris Costa has the latest on that massive fire. We now know one woman was sent to the hospital. And Dustin Blakowski just heard from fire officials. He will tell us about the fire marshal's investigation. First, though, this block has a history in Sanford. You may remember a mother who wanted to take her street back from the drug dealers she suspected were selling in a school zone with help from her friends and neighbors. Carrie Ziegel brought awareness to the problem. A few weeks later, Sanford police arrested a suspected drug dealer for trafficking drugs in a school zone. Now Chris Costa first reported on this story tonight. He is back on that block for a very different reason. But Chris, the house that went up in flames has been on police radar for a while. Yes, Amanda, that's right. I just want to tell you a little bit about what you're looking at right now. You can see in the distance there a number of fire crews. We've seen them starting to clean up. Just a few moments ago, we saw Central Maine power crews also leave the scene. There was obviously due to the fire uh, part of a power outage for, to an, uh, a portion of this neighborhood. Uh, you had mentioned, Amanda, uh, that the police have had this neighborhood kind of on their radar. We spoke to the deputy chief earlier today. Uh, one thing that he told us was that they have arrested people at the home where this fire originated at 30, 33 Island Avenue. Uh, they've arrested people who live there. They have not arrested them at the home, but they have arrested them as that, that being their permanent address uh, on drug charges in the past. Uh, we, as we told you when we've spoken with Carrie Zelke before, um, this is an area that she believes is, is rampant with drug activity. We know there have been previous arrests of people um, also in this general vicinity uh, regarding drug trafficking charges. It is about uh, 200 feet or less from a school uh, and that elevates those drug trafficking charges. Uh, so police, yes, have had this area on their radar for quite some time. Uh, you can kind of hear those trucks backing up in the distance. There were dozens of fire departments here. Uh, Arundel, Acton, uh, North Berwick, Sanford, uh, Alfred, um, and that's just to name a few. There were dozens and dozens of first responders here, uh, as well as Sanford police uh, trying to control all of the streets in this area because it is kind of like a grid. Uh, we want to send it now to Dustin Blodkowski, who has the latest. He just heard from fire officials about the latest on the investigation into this fire. Yeah, Chris, this information coming in la the, just the last 20 minutes or so. Firefighters say that there were a few injuries as a result of the fire here. One person actually had a heart attack because of what happened, and a number of people were taken into uh, ob observation because they were having anxiety attacks. Firefighters also say that this fire spread very quickly to five different buildings in the surrounding area. They also say there were a number of difficult conditions they were facing, like power lines down in the street. We had rapidly advancing fire uh, through multiple buildings, uh, so we had a heavy fuel load. We had a strong wind blowing that fire. Uh, of course, always initially you can never get enough manpower or water where you need it initially. And we also, because of the location of the power lines, we had power lines burning and falling in the street, which makes the firefighters' working uh, area that much more dangerous to have to deal with. And because those power lines came down, power has been shut off to the surrounding blocks around here. Firefighters expect that to continue until about midnight or so. They're also continuing their investigation to figure out exactly where this fire started. Back to you, Chris. All right, Dustin, thank you. I want to bring in Carrie Zelke now. Carrie lives uh, right across the street. Uh, around the corner really from where firefighters believe this fire started. Uh, there's literally one house that separates your home from where firefighters believe this started. Can you tell us what you saw, what you heard? Um, 
I was in my kitchen and I heard somebody scream, oh my God, and get out. And I looked out the window and I saw a puff of smoke. And by the time I had gotten out the door, uh, there was a fireball, just an explosion out of the first and second floor of 33 Island. And the building went up within seconds and then it spread to the other, the other buildings around it so quickly. What, what kind of thoughts were going through your head? That um, I know the building next to 33, there's a mom, uh, she's pregnant, and there was some young children in the home. So I was calling 911 and banging on doors, trying to get everybody out. I was even screaming up to the, the squatters in 33 for them to get out, hoping that they were okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, you had spoken with me in the past we've, when we've come out and done stories previously. Um, your whole mission has been to kind of take back your block. Uh, you believe there's a lot of drug activity going on in that neighborhood across from your street. Uh, police have talked about that, that they know that there's drug activity going on uh, in some of those res residences. Can you tell us what the nature is of those homes? You had told me at one point those homes were vacant, but then you just mentioned squatters. Can you explain that? Um, yep. Yeah, uh, the last tenant that was uh, leased to uh, live there had moved out recently, so um, the building that the fire originated from was completely vacant. Um, but there, the police weren't aware of squatters and had been actively trying to remove them from the home. Um, that's also where uh, Joshua Norda was arrested twice. Um, so the building had a lot of problems. Um, just, just seeing all of that happen and you know the other properties in the area with young families, it was just a lot. Speaking of young families, we heard from uh, Shannon Kendall uh, as we were coming to this scene. Uh, she told us a little bit about what she saw as she was trying to uh, get her eight-month-old eight child away from the scene. She lived right next door. Here's what she had to say. It was terrifying. I mean, when you hear something like that that goes off and you have an eight-month-old, you're terrified. I'm glad you guys are okay. <laughs> I praise God that I'm okay. I praise God that my baby's okay. What thoughts are going through your head right now? I hope that everyone else that was that was a lot closer to it, like actually with their houses on fire, I hope that everyone's okay. So I want to bring Carrie back in now. Carrie, do you do you know? And we'll have to pardon some of the noise from one of the fire trucks coming in from Dayton here. Um, but did do you know any of those people who had been squatting in that home nearby? Um, I only knew of um, one gentleman. His name is Frank. Um, he, uh, him and his girlfriend were on the third floor, and he was, he's an older man. Um, they were able to get out with their two dogs. Um, I'm not sure how he's doing. I've heard that he was having some smoke inhalation problems. What firefighters did tell us that they did transport a man who believed he was having a heart attack to the hospital uh, for possible smoke inhalation. We're still waiting for a lot of the details from the fire department, from the police, about the origin of the fire, how many people were involved, uh, and just exactly what really happened here. Amanda, we want to send it back to you now in the studio. All right, Chris Costa live in Sanford. We're going to circle back a little bit later on in the show. Meanwhile, students at Lafayette Elementary School were sent home early this afternoon because officials believed that school was too close to the fire scene. Parents were asked to pick their kids up at a nearby church or the students went home on buses. Now, just a few months ago, firefighters were all hands on deck in Sanford when the old textile mill caught fire. The smoke showed from today's fire behind the burned out husk of former the Stenton Trust Mill. Police have charged three juveniles with starting that fire back in July. All right, we will update you on any developments out of Sanford for now. Let's turn to Keith Carson, who has a first look at the forecast. Keith, you've been promising a stellar weekend. Still looking pretty good? It's looking really good, yeah. I mean, today, obviously, a beautiful day. Uh, currently still in the 70s in a lot of spots, 64 in Portland, 61 in Bangor, but 70 in Freiburg. We have a front approaching. You can see it on satellite here. Not much moisture, though, uh, correlated with this, so a few showers over far northern Maine will about do it. Most of us tonight will just see a couple of clouds pass through. The front will be to our east by tomorrow morning and <clears throat> will be mostly sunny through the day on Friday. So here we are, there's that front, a couple of those showers. Most of us still remain dry and those clouds are just along the coastline. By tomorrow morning, everybody is sunny. We'll be about five or six degrees cooler when compared to today. That's really the main difference that the front brings in. But it doesn't last very long because we go back to the sunny skies and get us back to the upper 60s and low 70s 
over the weekend. Saturday and Sunday both looking good. Tonight, temperatures aren't going to really fall off a cliff because of the clouds and isolated showers. They'll get insulated here and stay in the 40s for most of us, maybe 39, 40 degrees in Berlin, but uh, still officially no hard frost, uh, Amanda, in Portland. Only got down to 33 a couple of nights ago. All right, thanks, Keith. Cities all over the country are clamoring to be the next site of Amazon's headquarters, and two main towns submitted applications. Do they stand a chance? That story when we come back. All right, Maine needs to attract young, skilled workers and keep them here with well paying jobs and good quality of life. And two communities in Maine think retail giant Amazon could help bring those workers here. Scarborough and Brunswick both submitted proposals to the retail giant asking Amazon to build their brand new headquarters or HQ2 in their towns. Now all over the country cities are fighting for this opportunity because there's a lot at stake here. Amazon has promised to invest five billion dollars in whichever city it picks. Amazon will keep their original headquarters in Seattle, but this one will be just as big. The company also says it would bring up to 50,000 new jobs with an average salary of more than $100,000. Now the town of Scarborough is inviting Amazon to locate on the site of Scarborough Downs. In Brunswick, the application comes from Brunswick Landing, where they say there's a great opportunity at the former Navy base. Amazon has said it wants to be near a large metropolitan area and an airport and a population of about a million people. Neither main town fits that description, but leaders of both Brunswick and Scarborough tell us they believe finding workforce would not be a problem for a company like Amazon. And I think this is something uh, big enough that uh, it's truly, if you build it, they, they will come. I don't think that's a unique challenge or limitation for Scarborough's application. It's something of this scale, if it got to this scale, people would move to Maine, young families would move to Maine, and that's something we want. Deadline for entries is today. Both Scarborough and Brunswick Landing admit they are long shots in a competition against several hundred other bigger cities and towns, but both said it's worth a try. Now, there's no doubt Seattle benefits from being Amazon's hometown, but they want cities to know there are struggles involved. For one, as Amazon grows, so does its headquarters, meaning there's constant construction. Again, good for jobs, but it can be a nightmare for traffic and noise. There's also skyrocketing real estate prices in Seattle, meaning the elderly or families are being forced to move out of their homes and find a cheaper place to live. According to the Seattle Times, the median home price doubled in the last five years. Experts say Amazon's success is a major factor. All right, still to come on now. If you're doing your job right, you're treating people right, the cameras, you don't even know they're there. Portland police are one step closer to getting body cameras, but what's it like to actually wear one in the field? And it's peak foliage season for parts of the state. This weekend is a great one to get outdoors. Keith Carson has the full forecast coming up next. All right, it's been a national debate for years. Are police body cameras able to strengthen relationships within the community? The Portland Police Department is one step closer to saying yes. Now, just last week, the PD and city staff reached a tentative agreement for new contracts, which would include wage increases and introduce body cameras for all officers. You might remember May and Strimling and other advocacy groups calling for body cameras after a homeless man was shot by an officer back in January. Chance Baker was witnessed waving a pellet rifle in a shopping plaza parking lot, and when he wouldn't cooperate, officers shot and killed him. Now, this incident reignited the body cam debate. Right next door, South Portland PD has had body cams for almost a year now. So, what is it like for an officer to have to have his or her every move recorded? We sent Christina Rex to ride along with an officer to find out. It's as easy as one. And we basically sign them out with this. Two. This one lit up. Three. One additional step to suiting up before a South Portland police officer heads out the door for duty. Yeah. They teach us coming out of the academy. Every call you go on, you should pretend like somebody's recording you. Um, in this day and age with cell phones and all the technology, I mean, chances are people are. The body cameras were introduced to the department in the beginning of 2017. Officers are required to wear them all day, but only have to hit record for police interactions, like traffic stops and arrests. In the beginning, some officers weren't happy with the idea of a camera documenting their every move at work. 
But 10 months into the program, Officer Rocco Navarro says these tiny cameras have proved to be more helpful than harmful. All recorded video goes back to the police station, but can also be watched back instantly in the police cruiser. South Portland is the biggest city in the state where officers wear cameras. That is, unless the Portland City Council votes to pass a new contract proposal for the Portland Police Department. Officer Navarro says it's about strengthening police community relations. It takes away any, dis you know, any discrepancies. You know, how do you lie about a video? Um, so, I mean, there, it's basically a tool. You can use it to your advantage. And then again, um, you know, if you're doing something wrong, you know, that's where you're gonna you're gonna get caught up. He has one piece of advice for Portland police officers if they do end up getting body cameras. You know, if you're doing your job right, if you're treating people right, the cameras you don't even know they're there. In South Portland, Christina Rex, News Center. All right, though a tentative contract agreement has been reached in the city of Portland, it's still going to take some time before we see cameras on the officers. The city council will vote on the contracts in its upcoming meeting on November 6th. Okay, firefighters from all over southern Maine battling a fire in Sanford this evening. Chris Costa is live on the scene. We want to check back in with him. Chris, what's happening around you right now? So Amanda, just so you know kind of where the scene is relative to where we are, uh, it, ha it happened on Island Avenue, which is kind of diagonally back that way. The first street over here is Russell Street, and then the next one down from that is Thompson. The fire occurred on Island Ave between those two streets, Russell and Thompson. So Russell, uh, probably le less than 100 yards away from us. Uh, so that fire probably uh, happened about 100 yards away. Right now, uh, the scene is, is safe because firefighters have started to pack up, roll up their hoses, uh, clean up. They had been dealing with some hot spots for a while, but no um, active fire that they're concerned about at this point. Uh, we're still waiting to hear more details from the firefighters. As far as the people here, they say they heard uh, you know, a loud noise like glass breaking. They saw fire shooting out of the windows on the first floor porch at the home on Island Avenue. We know that one woman was taken to the hospital, uh, another man also taken to the hospital, but we don't know the extent of their injuries. We also don't know how many people were possibly inside the home at the time of the fire and if any others were taken to the hospital. But as far as we know, no firefighters injured in this scene. We'll continue to bring you more coming up on New Center at 530 and at 6. Amanda, back to you. All right, Chris Costa, thank you. Meanwhile, our social media accounts are being inundated with photos and videos of this fire. One photo comes to us from Amber Crocker. She says these boys are trying to save their cat from the flames. I want to remind everyone to be safe and check up on their friends and neighbors in the area. Already, we've been seeing on our Facebook pages people kind of tagging each other, saying, "Hey, are you okay? Yeah. Make sure." Well, you know, and it's dry too. That doesn't. I mean, this is not a forest fire, but we had several of those right. in Maine yesterday. And even though this is a different kind of fire, that's a danger we're actually going to have here for the next week or two because it's been so dry, so warm. Sensibly, very nice though, right? I mean, look at uh, Higgins Beach. I think I have it pulled up there. Look at that. I mean, I, wow. I've been going the past couple of days out. It's it's Beach, warm enough. Beach two days in a row. Yeah, Look it's warm enough for short sleeves for sure. Now, I did the shorts today, and that might have been a bad decision, but the point is, it is unusual for late October. It's been really beautiful out there. Today's highs officially in the mid 70s in Sanford at 74, 66 in Portland, 62 in Rockham. These temperatures way above average. Millinocket, particularly 71 degrees there. Got a cold front on the way. You'll notice it only has just a little cluster of showers towards Quebec. Most of this stuff that will continue to move through and uh, die out as it moves into Maine. So overnight tonight, basically a few clouds, an isolated shower in the northern mountains. That uh, tends to dry out, though, as it moves towards the coastline. Tomorrow is a nice, bright day. It is cooler than today. Not that that's saying much. We'll be around 65 to 67 degrees for most of us through tomorrow afternoon. But again, beautiful, bright day. And then the same deal on Saturday, back to around 70 degrees under mostly sunny skies. And we'll do it again Sunday and Monday. The only uh, wrinkle in the forecast uh, at all is that uh, northern Maine will see slightly cooler temperatures Saturday and Sunday. This is just kind of a, a facsimile of what's going to happen. It'll be around 70 over southern Maine, 65 over the mid coast. But when you get north of Millinocket into Presque Isle, Caribou, uh, Holton will be involved in this. Temperatures here will be right around 60 to 55. So it will be much cooler over far northern Maine. Speaking of which, uh, you know what? I didn't want to show you this. I didn't want to show you this yet. Oh, don't look at it. Avert your eyes. 
Avert your eyes. That's little that's, teaser. That's brain drops. Uh oh. Anyways, that's all right. I think Spoiler. I, I think I moved too quickly. We, sh we should be okay. Again, weekend's fantastic, and then the pattern kind of falls apart. Tuesday night, Wednesday, and. Thursday, perhaps some legitimate rain coming in during that time period. So I think it'll feel a lot different uh, late, mid to late next week compared to what it is now. So enjoy it if you like it. As far as people waiting for, s for real, real cool stuff, oh, I yeah. think we're going to have to wait uh, till November for that. Wow. So That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Keith. More local news ahead on News Center at 530. Cindy Williams has a preview. Hey, Cindy. Hi guys. Yeah, coming up at 530, a woman says that a local hospital confiscated her medical marijuana. Now, the plant for medicinal use is legal in Maine. We'll explain why the hospital says they are just obeying the law. And we'll talk with a family who just returned from Puerto the Rico. They had to go to the destroyed island themselves in order to get their relatives the supplies that they need. What they have to say about the damage there. Those stories and more coming up at 530. All right, brain drops today. Uh, you know, we talked about seasonal outlook. Uh, National Weather Service NOAA has put out their official outlook as of today for the winter. And this is precipitation. Now, they don't differentiate between snow and rain because they're smarter than us. <laughs> and it's enough. very, very difficult <laughs> to forecast that in advance. Notice that Maine is just in the equal chances and then it's wetter here in the Midwest. Now, for temperatures, though, they're all in on Maine being well above average. Well above average. It's the next graphic. Uh, there it is, 40% or more above average chances, which is really, really high. So they're, they're big on us being uh, warm. Now, this mirrors something we talked about a few days ago, the La Nina. They're all in mm -hmm. on La Nina because if you look at the schematic for what La Nina looks like, uh, a La Nina winter is almost exactly like this. That's the next graphic. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It's almost exactly These the, are his hints. the same. You'll notice that it is wet and cool in the Midwest, and then we're about equal. So basically, the National Weather Service NOAA, what they're doing is they're all in on a La Nina. I, myself, I'm not as big a fan of this forecast. So we come out with the seasonal forecast every year, me, Todd, and the rest of the gang. Right. We're cooking that up right now. I don't think it's going to be the same as what NOAA has out here. Interesting. So, um, okay. That's what makes it fun, because seasonal forecasting is difficult. Hmm, so difficult. who do we trust more? I don't know. But either way, more precipitation, it seems like. There, yes. There's no more graphics. That's it. We're, we're done. <laughs> Everyone can relax. We're at 530 surgery right now. <laughs>